Welcome, it's my pleasure to invite you back to the afternoon sessions now of the second day of the Unite Global Summit 2022. This first session of the afternoon will focus on uh, hepatitis and the actions needed to engage parliamentarians for its elimination. Specifically, the session will address the rationale for triple elimination of HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis B infection as an urgent priority for strengthening health systems and enabling countries to deliver on global commitments, including the United Nations sustainable development goals. I will now, uh, or it's my pleasure to introduce our co-chairs for this session. First, uh, Carrie James, who is the CEO of the World Hepatitis Alliance. And joining him is the Honorable Gisela Scaglia, former member of parliament from Argentina, and also Unite Chapter Chair for Latin America and the Caribbean. I hand over to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, so as she said, my name is Carrie James from the World Hepatitis Alliance. And my name is Gisela Scaglia, and thank you for having me. We are going to have a good meeting. Absolutely. It's a great honor to be here and to be with all of you online as well. Uh, we've got a really great lineup of speakers, so I'm not going to spend too much time in the introduction, but just saying that you know, the new triple elimination strategies are just so important to improve the lives of mothers and babies all around the world. Um, and it's also a great opportunity for us to, to work together as different sectors with the you know, HIV sector, hepatitis, traditional hepatitis services, to really focus on the needs of the, of the people, the needs of the patients, of the mothers, and not just on the needs of like a specific um, disease response. Um, and if any of you are on social media, hopefully today, you would have seen that um, there's an open letter um, to Gavi um, in the Lancet GastroHep calling on Gavi to, um, to commence their program for hepatitis B birth dose. Because we know um, from data from the CDA Foundation that last year a quarter of a million children were born or um, acquired hepatitis B at birth. Um, and all of those could have been avoided, or uh, you know, nine out of ten of them could be avoided if they would have had the birth dose vaccine. So it's a very, um, it's a very topical topic, um, so we're really excited to get started. Um, so, and we're very honored to start off today um, with um, an amazing uh, H um, hepatitis B advocate, um, someone living with hepatitis B, uh, Shaibu Isa from Tanzania. So, Shaibu, are you there? Hello. Hello. Hello, welcome. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, can I share my screen? You may, yes. Ah, okay, okay, thank you very much. Sorry, I got a big problem with share my screen. Find the share button or? Yeah, okay. You're very welcome to just speak as well, if you prefer. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, okay, my name is Shaibu Isa. Uh, I am from Tanzania, and I am currently uh, living with viral uh, hepatitis. And uh, my lived experience story uh, started from high school, uh, where my brother uh, started to feel stomachache for a while, uh, and I go to the test. So after I come back, uh, he realized that uh, he has been infected. So I follow up to, uh, he advised me to, to do the same. And uh, I went uh, in the hospital for the test. So after testing, I found that I've been uh, affected with the virus. Uh, so from there uh, is where uh, maximum stigma, uh, discrimination, and the social isolation started from the people who knew that uh, we have been affected. 
uh, it started from uh, from our fellow students, our teachers, our healthcare worker, and everyone that I knew that we have been uh, affected uh, with uh, 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 this disease. So it was a very difficult uh, to find a treatment uh, in hospital because uh, hepatitis in Africa is very expensive. It's very expensive uh, to treat. And for us, because uh, I come from a poor family, uh, it was a very uh, hard to find uh, uh, a treatment. So we did uh, a fundraising uh, from different um, uh, uh, organization, uh, people, our fellow students, um, and uh, other people who contributing some money for us. But it was not uh, enough. Although we have been admitted uh, at Mohimbili National Hospital uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the treatment, but it was very hard. Uh, to the stage, uh, my family sold uh, each uh, uh, and everything, such as the land uh, and life we stock to, uh, to cover the cost uh, of treatment. So at that time, we were a student at university, so it was very difficult to manage stress of diseases uh, at a bank student. So we do that time, but we failed to attend uh, in the clinic uh, because we had no money. So we proceeded to fundraise to the people to help us, but uh, we never were able to meet it. So after graduation, uh, my brother died for liver cancer. And uh, I remain uh, a patient. Uh, uh, so I started to as a struggle. And later on, I come to realize that uh, I was not myself because many people suffer stigma uh, and discrimination due to poor knowledge and uh, awareness uh, about disease. So in Africa, people don't know uh, about this disease. So there is a lot of misconception. Uh, of misinformation eh? and misconception. So misinformation uh, make people uh, not to to uh, to to need it to test it, to uh, to go to test it, the status. So um, hepatitis in Africa is kill more people than uh, HIV um, uh, and malaria, and uh, we need it. Uh, to support us in this global movement for uh, uh, B, And I would like to, uh, to please people uh, to gender uh, this movement. So uh, for that time, I decided to, uh, to start being advocates because I never see anyone speak about this. Uh, nobody cares. So I start to uh, advocate um, in social media and to uh, I have more than um, more than 100,000 people now who follow me for psychological support and who want accurate uh, information uh, about this. So I use it uh, to help them. So still there is a problem of stigma uh, and discrimination. And this is come because many people are not aware about this disease. So many people get disease and they come to realize uh, in late stage. So many people come to develop uh, a stage uh, of liver cancer because they can't uh, detect disease uh, in yellow stage. So we can find a way to address this disease. And I please you, leader uh, uh, MP, to join us in the movement of eliminating viral uh, uh, hepatitis, especially in Africa, because half of the number of people who have been infected with this disease, uh, we come uh, in Africa, we're residing uh, in Africa. And it's just because there is no uh, allocation uh, of the vaccine. Hepatitis can be, uh, can be sure prevented uh, with the dose vaccine, but uh, we, uh, we don't have uh, uh, enough vaccine or many government uh, do not take it uh, uh, as a serious disease. But it's the reality that in every 30 second, someone die uh, for the complication. How is it? So I please uh, people, uh, your government uh, and leader to join us uh, in this effort to make 
uh, elimination uh, of this disease uh, through uh, enable testing. You know, if we testing people uh, and know their condition in early stage, it will uh, be good for them uh, to take uh, a important step to 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 uh, uh, to be safe for the management of the disease. But also, uh, we we we, uh, we need to prevent it, a disease. And the best way to prevent this disease uh, is through uh, to vaccinate people. So vaccination can reduce uh, infection for more than uh, uh, for more than 90 percent. So if we're going to uh, to to administer a best dose vaccine, we are going uh, to save more than 90 percent of new cases uh, of hepatitis B, and we are going to save for the 60 percent uh, of the deaths according to uh, this disease. So I beg you, we can take this step to make sure that the triple elimination of uh, HIV, uh, hepatitis, and syphilis become a reality because. People die in Africa. People die. People associate this disease uh, with uh, issues like a superstition. Uh, people don't like question. They stigmatize. They stigmatize me. Uh, and other people they can't even expose the, their situation because they are afraid to be isolated uh, into the community. I facing a lot while I decided to be a great advocate because I know that I can contribute some point and make people understand uh, about the disease. So thank you very much for listening to me. My name uh, is Shai Buisa. Thank you so much, Shai. It was an honor to have you as part of our panel today. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to my co-chair for the next segment. Thank you, Shabi. You're sorry it's uh, so important for us. Now um, we are going to give the floor to the Dr. Fumilesi. Hepatitis Team Lead, Department of HIV, Hepatitis and STA, World Health Organization. Um, I don't know if you can hear us, Dr. Fumilesi. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, okay, the floor is yours. I hear you and I see you, and I'm really delighted to be here. Good morning and good afternoon. My name is Dr. Fumilesi from WHO Geneva. Now, can I share my two slides, if this is possible? Okay, it's not letting me share the slides because somebody else is sharing the slide. Okay, just uh, hold on one second are, for me. Yes, okay. it's okay. Okay, great. Now. Yes. So I just have a few slides. And um, please permit me to share this slide. Could you? And I will be quite brief. So thank you, thank you so much for inviting me to this session to highlight some of the rationale and opportunity for triple elimination of HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis B, and set the scene for a stimulating discussion. I thank Shaibu very much for sharing his story. It's amazing, the story. But in that background, hepatitis B is endemic, affects over 296 million people over multiple regions and continent. And it's responsible for nearly a million deaths worldwide from the effect of liver cancer and liver cirrhosis, which are causing undiagnosed and untreated long-term infections. Yet, less than 10% of people living with the infection has been diagnosed, as you would see on the right side of the screen, the first chart, and less than 2% are on treatment, despite the availability of the tools and the effective therapy, and it is really, really a paradox. Now, hepatitis B and HIV are syndemics. The overlapping epidemics mean that there is significant co-infection. So it's really no surprise that up to 7.4% of people living with HIV also have hepatitis B, and they have an accelerated progression of liver-related mortality, again compromising the gains from 40 years of HIV response. 
Now, early childhood infection and vertical transmission from mother to child represent the most important route of transmission. And that is why a Shaibu and his brother can have the same infection because it's often transmitted in childhood within the family. Now, with advances of science, we do know that a combination of hepatitis B versus those vaccine and antenatal screening care represent the most potent interventions to prevent transmission. In fact, in endemic areas like in Africa, where Shabu comes from, less than 17% have access to birth dose and even less to PMTCT interventions. So this triple elimination provides comprehensive integrated care, and there are multiple studies that demonstrate that it is feasible, it is cost effective, it saves lives from cancer, and provides care for the mother and for the baby and for other members of the family. It's an excellent example of person-centered care and integration, and these are priority interventions for elimination of transmission of the three infections by 2030. Now, this is an essential part of the new WHO Global Strategy, and it's in line with the SDG targets for hepatitis B. It provides a critical opportunity to advocate for inclusion of hepatitis B in pre-existing dual elimination programs of HIV and syphilis. Now, there are some important parallels and synergies of hepatitis B and HIV. Now, both are chronic long-term diseases. Both are often silent with long latency period and infected moms may be unaware and have no symptoms. Now, both of these infections can be identified during the antenatal period with rapid point of care tests. Both use similar diagnostic platforms and both can be treated. So WHO recommends hepatitis B birth dose vaccination to all newborns since the late 1990s. An antenatal maternal testing in 2015 an antiviral prophylaxis in 2020. Yet this is not being implemented in many countries. WHO now has a global guidance to measure and track the progress and guide country validation of triple elimination of HIV, hepatitis, and syphilis, as has been done with polio elimination. So we are really waiting to celebrate countries that are on the track to elimination. And modeling studies show that this is feasible. Now, for global impact, this innovative approach needs to be implemented in countries. And there are important operational considerations and planning and commitment. So political commitment and leadership from every country governance, policy framework, funding, allocation of resources, and inclusion of triple elimination within national essential health service packages are important. The recent global fund endorsement of triple elimination is a huge boost as it will provide the catalytic investment needed to transform this intervention in country allocations. So parliamentarians can make a difference. They can influence key strategic and political de decisions, and they can impact the, the future, even in this generation. So for us, this is a very important talk because parliamentarians are a key developmental partner in moving this forward. And on that note, I will say thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity to make a pitch on hepatitis B and PMTCT. Thanks to Kerry for inviting me and to World Hepatitis Alliance. Thank you very much and over. Thank you, Dr. Lesti, and thank you for your words and your knowledge. Um, now, um, we are going to invite to the floor to Dr. Roland Manden, Technical Director, Elizabeth Glasser Pediatrics AIDS Foundation from Tanzania. Um, Dr. Roland, can yeah, you thank hear? Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this important uh, symposium on uh, triple elimination agenda. And you just heard from WHO the importance of it and a testimony also from Tanzania. I'm uh, a technical director with the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation and working already for the last 12 years in Tanzania um, with our aim of um, eliminating pediatric AIDS through uh, strengthening the prevention of mother-to-child transmission programs in Tanzania, as well as ensuring that there is access to uh, quality and optimal uh, regimen for children and their families. And I think it is, uh, I'm pleased to, to share with you our experiences from Tanzania, how we have moved and embedded the triple elimination agenda. Um, the elimination agenda for mother-to-child transmission started already in 2012 with the first uh, EMTCT plan. And over the years that has evolved uh, from not just focusing on HIV, the second plan actually <coughs> added already the syphilis. Um, so when in 2021, uh, a new reproductive and maternal newborn and child health plan was developed, um, the Ministry of Health together with development partners and implementing partners uh, already embraced the, the new, the latest guidelines from WHO to ensure that this is an opportunity to also include hepatitis B, um, uh, leveraging the strong PMTCT program that is in country that is being supported by the, the, the main donors like <coughs> PEPFAR and Global Fund. And the rationale for doing so is what actually WHO uh, uh, Lacey already highlighted is that uh, Syphilis and particularly hepatitis B are still uh, elements that are lagging behind in terms of and do not receive the same attention as HIV. Um, the coverage of syphilis testing is still only at 65% in country, while the, the HIV testing among pregnant women is, is 99, close to 100%. And hepatitis B prevalence in Tanzania is at 4%, which is not far off from the HIV prevalence of 4.7%. So the same large population is affected as with HIV. So it's really interesting and uh, um, that through the Ministry of Health and implementing partners, we were able to add this uh, component on the, the ENTCT agenda. And um, to understand the barriers and challenges, we developed guiding principles to, for the implementation of this EMTCT plan. And uh, you can see here some 10 enablers that need to be worked on. Um, I will not go through all of them, but I do want to highlight a few important ones, and those are the first three on making sure that there is equity and equality in the delivery of PMTCT services to ensure that all the population have access uh, to, the, to these services. And I think this is where we need to draw lessons from, for example, the PEPFAP programs that are working on HIV. Um, um, we are focusing on high volume sites in the country, but we have a lot of people in rural areas uh, that also need the access to services, and they are often underserved because maybe uh, the volume is not as, as big and therefore they do not have access to services, as well as the decentralization of, for example, uh, diagnostics is still something that needs to be worked on. Gender equity is also important. Um, PMTCT services is focusing on the pregnant women, the mother and their children, but we do need to ha uh, understand that access also requires a man to be involved. To enhance couple relations and healthy living for the family is important. Currently, under the HIV program, we only reach 75% of the men that are tested together with their with their. Uh, their wives, and this is another area that we really need to emphasize. And you just heard the story of Shaibu uh, on the, uh, how important it is also to involve the community themselves. The community participation is really important if we want to uh, create understanding and create demand in, in the community. They are part of the solutions and they will be able to, to inform how best to, to implement these services. So what is needed to take this forward? And we are happy that in Tanzania we have the EMTCT plan three ready that includes hepatitis B. But uh, we are not there yet. A plan is just a plan and it needs to be operationalized. And that calls for ensuring that there's adequate financial resources for the inputs 
and operational activities. And it, here where we can leverage the, the PEPFAR platform for HIV programming, but it does call for um, making sure that budgets are also allocated for some of the things like what was already highlighted, access to uh, the vaccine at birth. Demand creation, uh, making people aware that hepatitis B is just as a, a serious disease like HIV and it may not be seen immediately, but in the long term effects are, are really devastating for the families that are affected. And monitoring and continuous learning, uh, we need to set up the systems as well to be able that we document the data. I think for many countries, including Tanzania, there is a lack of data on what is actually the burden of hepatitis B at the moment. So we need to also to make sure we invest in, in data systems. So since we are here with parliamentarians, just want to highlight the advocacy efforts that are still needed. For, for first and foremost, of course, with the government and the donors to ensure that resources are made available, but also for the parliamentarians themselves to make sure that they prioritize uh, uh, resource allocation and that they provide the oversight that the legal frameworks and the policies for triple eliminations are not just only developed but actually implemented. It also calls for local government uh, now at the, the district level uh, to, to ensure that also they allocate resources and, and not only financial resources but human resources to provide oversight and the coordination of the implementation of PMTCT services. And lastly, I think Shaibu was a, a, a living testimony that the community structures are also important to make sure uh, that these services are being supported. So um, these are the experiences from Tanzania, and I really thank you uh, as organizers for the opportunity to share these, uh, these experiences. Thank you, Roland. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, it's very important your experience, and thank you for sharing with us. Now um, we are going to have uh, the, the presentation of Dr. Sean Ward, Director of Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination. And you can go here, or you are going to, to have. I just stand up. As you want. <laughs> <laughs> Good day, everyone. Hopefully my mic is on and everyone can hear me. It's great to be here. As was mentioned, I'm with the uh, Global uh, Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination of the Task Force for Global Health in the United States. I have a, a slide set, if I could um, see that, uh, please. Uh, probably it's impossible. Thank you. Um, Sean? Probably. It's needed uh, another mic. Okay. No, they can't hear in Spanish. They can't hear. Oh, they can't hear the Spanish. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why. You can hear? Yeah. No? Okay. Okay, okay. continue. <laughs> okay, thank you. We work in three areas to help uh, countries put in place effective hepatitis elimination programs. In this case, we're talking about one of the most achievable parts of hepatitis elimination, which is uh, prevention of mother-to-child transmission of hepatitis B virus. We've been particularly focused on a key uh, prevention component, a timely delivery of a dose of hepatitis B vaccine to a newborn, which can prevent 70 to 90% of transmissions of hepatitis B. We've been working to get um, communities of practice together to help um, vaccinators share lessons learned. We've been putting together uh, bodies of evidence to help with that. We've been working with local community organizations to build the awareness that we've been hearing about is underappreciated, and we're developing a separate, uh, a variety of different uh, tools. With our uh, community partners, we've, um, we've been um, putting together a, um, a variety of promotional activities I'm going to show you some slides to reinforce the importance of hepatitis B elimination um, through mother-to-child transmission prevention with a background a soundtrack from Flaviana, a, a community advocate from Uganda. Free the next generation. Free the next generation. Free the next generation. I can hear the children of my land are crying. Because I leave a failure and I've done no pain. Mother to child, and fat transmission. Ninety percent of them with lifetime infection. But all mothers, it's a happy day. Introducing hepatitis B vaccines. We have got another vaccine now. Hey, hepatitis B is one now. No more leave a cancer now. Now, let our babies have a smile. Like a bird up in the sky. Everything will be 
hepatitis B can be prevented through a timely vaccine given to babies in the first 24 hours of life. We call upon government to introduce the hepatitis B backdoors. This will give every child an equitable chance to survive and thrive in life. This message is brought to you by the Ministry of Health in partnership with the Hepatitis A organization with support from the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination and CDC. Thank you. And that's really why we're all here today, is to get your help to, to fr free the next generation of major health risk of HIV, hepatitis B, and syphilis. And that's fully achievable if we all work together. Um, this is just to announce that this month we'll be releasing a toolkit to help countries develop the policies to put in place routine hepatitis B vaccination. I want to do, by extension, we recognize and while we're here, the important role of governments in our elimination efforts. So we have been working at the UN level to engage countries to increase the aware awareness of the benefits of hepatitis elimination and have them come to the table. One way that's done at the UN is for member states to put, come together in group of friends to uh, unite against the common cause. In this case, hepatitis elimination, um, uh, uh, a group of friends was formed to, um, to strengthen information sharing and health diplomacy, frankly, for hepatitis elimination. And I wanted to give you um, uh, how that uh, event went uh, on September 20th at the UN General Assembly in New York City. Truly, we're at a miraculous moment. I sense a real momentum now because we have these great drugs and very good tests. I want to thank the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination, the Task Force for the Global Health, and all the members, states, and partners here today for bringing us together. We estimate that there are currently over 300 million cases of chronic hepatitis B and hepatitis C worldwide, and an estimated 3 million people getting newly infected each year and 1.1 million deaths. And this is just simply put too much. Hepatitis has been neglected for far too long. We are very glad to share our experiences in this regard. It expresses full support to the group of friends that are getting to, to lead the effort for the first year. Portugal supports the creation of the UN Group for Friends to Eliminate Hepatitis, which we'll be proud to join. The formation invites all member states to join us in forming the UN Group of Friends to Eliminate Hepatitis. Ghana, therefore, is very happy and willing to join the UN group of friends to eliminate hepatitis. Dili joins happily and very determinedly this call to launch the UN group of friends for global elimination of viral hepatitis. We are delighted to take part in the present day event and express our willingness to become a member of the group of friends to eliminate hepatitis. We are willing, able and are here to be part of this friendship circle. The time has come for decisive collective action, which is why we appreciate this gathering. I hereby endorse the solemn commitment of the United Republic of Tanzania in joining the UN Group of Friends to combat chronic viral hepatitis. Sierra Leone is willing and happy to join the Group of Friends for the elimination of hepatitis. There is an African says if you want to go fast, go alone, if you want to go far, go together. Thank you. We want you to join us in this effort, so please do so. See how you can get involved in your countries. There are many countries that have more work to do. There are many countries that already have achieved great success coming together uh, can help us share those positive experiences and protect uh, more children from these three diseases. Uh, those are my uh, contact information. Um, uh, please feel free to contact me if you have any, any questions. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, John. It's incredible to see all those countries come together. I think it's going to be the start of something that's going to be really important. So thank you so much. Um, so now we're going to move on to uh, four country experiences, two from um, implementers in country and two from our honorable members of parliament who are um, with us here. But first, we're going to go to Rwanda. 
I mean, hear from Alida uh, Nuigi, who is Senior Program Manager at the, for Hepatitis at the Clinton Health Access Initiative in Rwanda. Alida? Hi, everyone. I'm checking if you can hear me. We can hear you. Can you hear me right? All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, share a little bit of what we are doing in Rwanda to uh, eliminate hepatitis B. My name is Alida Nguije. I work with Clinton Health Access Initiative in Rwanda as a senior program manager for infectious diseases. I've got five minutes, but I try to summarize uh, the initiatives we have around hepatitis B elimination in Rwanda. So Rwanda is a country of uh, 13 million and 280 people, uh, an estimate. And uh, when it comes to the number of pregnant women in country, they're estimated at 370,000 per year. Among this, 2.4% are estimated to be infected by hepatitis B. And among the babies who are born every year, 0.35% is estimated to be affected with hepatitis B. However, uh, in Rwanda, we have ANC systems that are very strong and so far very successful. Our ANC attendance is estimated at 98%. Birth, attendance at, birth attended by skilled health personnel is estimated at 93%, and children vaccination coverage is at 97%. So you could see that the country has put in place an uh, enabling environment to support ANC systems. However, uh, despite these efforts, when it comes to hepatitis B elimination, or hepatitis B uh, PMTCT, the country still has challenges. So one of them is that the screening of pregnant mothers is not systematically done. Uh, despite the existence of, of guidelines, uh, despite the existence of what is program, the screening of hepatitis B is very uh, low. Only 20% of pregnant women are actually screened. So there is, uh, there, there is a need to understand the reason behind, because when it comes to HIV, this screening is pretty uh, high. But when it comes to hepatitis B, we need to understand the issues, we need to understand the drivers um, and then uh, tackle the gaps. Again, when it comes to data, I think as Tanzania also shared, we have gaps in data. We can't uh, track pregnant women in the system. We can't know who are not linked on care and we need to improve this as well. Most importantly, uh, hepatitis B birth tools, a key intervention that is needed to eliminate uh, mother to child transmission is not yet introduced in Rwanda. Despite political will and despite the different other working interventions, uh, this in intervention has to be implemented for us to be able to achieve EMTCT. However, Rwanda has uh, implemented similar interventions like hepatitis C elimination that is currently uh, moving towards validation. And we also have strong HIV uh, programs in ANC. So we think that by building off on those um, systems that are working, we could also tackle hepatitis B elimination. And the way we're planning to do it, uh, Clinton Health Access Initiative in collaboration with the government, we have designed uh, an intervention that will focus on three, four main objectives to be able to support the country moving ahead with hepatitis B elimination. First objective, is to assess uh, the current gaps, to understand really, uh, as I said, what are the reasons behind limited or no screening of pregnant mothers, but also other challenges linked to linkage, linkage to care, and of course, uh, vaccination. So after we have conducted that assessment, we'll be able now to design specific interventions to support the uh, increasing uptake. Some of those interventions will, uh, will include training of healthcare workers to really make them be comfortable and be familiar with the guidelines, but also supporting commodity management system to ensure that tests are available. And again, uh, putting in place an ME system and, and data system to monitor women that are going through the ANC, uh, uh, ANC care. So the third objective and the most important is to introduce 
uh, to introduce a targeted hepatitis B birth dose uh, in Rwanda. And this is really to demonstrate that if we can uh, cover the targeted groups, then implementation countrywide is also possible. So this, uh, our aim is to implement a, de a demonstration project to show that a hepatitis B uh, hepatitis B virtues can be introduced in Rwanda. So we hope to, we, to cover this in the two years of the project. But beyond that, we we'll also have um, a, a, an evidence generation platform where we'll be gathering all the lessons learned throughout the implementation of the project that will be put together in uh, different materials that will be disseminated to help Rwanda, but also other countries in Africa to learn from our project, but also to start uh, similar initiatives in their countries. Thank you very much. Um, I'm available to respond to any questions uh, or follow up on email. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to hear the amazing work you guys are doing. And we will have an opportunity for question and answers um, when the, the presentations are finished. Um, so next, we're going to go to Cambodia um, and Savantha Huel, who is a senior program manager for hepatitis and HIV um, at the Hilton uh, Clinton Health Access Initiative. Thank you, um, the organizer. Thanks, uh, the parliamentarians and uh, ladies and gentlemen and other uh, guest speakers. Yeah. So, um, as you may know, that. Uh, the program, you know, on HIV and syphilis uh, are in the good mood, you know, in my country in particular. So it's a time to talk about the um, triple elimination, which includes uh, viral hepatitis B. Yeah. So because of the time, I'd like to give a bit of the uh, snapshot of the program, you know, how we start the PMTCT program. You know. uh, it's not too far from the WHO guidelines. Uh, Cambodia start launching the uh, uh, have, uh, the program, you know, our vaccine uh, program, which introduced the hepatitis uh, B vaccine since 2005. And two years later, we uh, introduced the happy birth dose. Uh, <coughs> up to now, we've got around 80% um, of the coverage of uh, 24 hours uh, happy birth dose, you know, during 2020. And then we first launched our first PMTCT strategy in Cambodia. Um, you know, of mother to child transmission for only HIV, which was in 2008, yeah. But then after about 10 years, the second strategy, you know, which expands from HIV screening to syphilis, you know, begin like in uh, 2017. So uh, in, in 2017, uh, there's also a study, you know, in Cambodia uh, led by ANRS to understand, uh, you know, um, have been uh, uh, among pregnant women, uh, pregnant women in Cambodia. So the evidence generated using the TAPROM algorithm, which is now part of the WHO gui guidelines influence, they introduced the uh, uh, surface antigen of among pregnant women. Yeah. So from the study and evidence, it was quite clear that uh, there's a good the benefit for the population uh, in the country. So the national program responsible for maternal and child health uh, start you know updating the guideline, moving from the, the the dual elimination to triple elimination guideline. Yeah. So it it's you know uh, started in 2020. Yeah, but then uh, the launch of the program has just recently uh, Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, started because of uh, multiple reasons. Yeah, the program actually uh, uh, received funding from the Global Fund through the RSSA grant. Yeah, it's just for the study, the pilot study to further understand HIV screening, just to generate more evidence. You know how to, to get the women, you know, on the uh, testing uptake and retention uh, throughout the cascade of care. So right now we've got, you know, the latest data uh, from October, we received uh, from the program, uh, you know, where the about 7,000 pregnant women tested on surface antigen, and we found about 2.8 uh, women, you know, uh, with the sensitivity to surface antigen, yes that the diagnosis uh, will be further required and treatment as well. Yeah. 
So the pro the the pilot, you know, got about one year delay because of the release of funding from the global fund. You know, was a bit late, plus the procurement uh, issue. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, procurement issues, you know, regarding the surface antigen and particularly on the e antigen. Yeah, I will talk about it uh, in the in a few minutes. Yeah, and in this year. Uh, you know, quarter four of this year, we start to work with the, you know, government, try to advocate for national budget to cover viral hepatitis, not just for Hep B, but also Hep C. But we make a very strong case that the PMTCT program for um, Hep B among pregnant women is uh, the core of the country because we've got HIV syphilis program implemented and we, we kind of have a very strong program in Cambodia. So um, it's, it's time to make the, the, the service available in an in integrated manner. Yeah, so as a result, the Ministry of um, uh, Economics and Finance, uh, you know, <coughs> approved a $1 million budget to help with the hepatitis program startup in Cambodia for the first time. So for hepatitis B, you know, uh, uh, in particular, uh, it's able to plan for about 10 out of 120 ODs in Cambodia. Yeah. It is quite small. Yeah. So after all, I like to talk about the challenge and barriers, you know, which are facing uh, uh, the program in the country. Although we try to uh, implement both dual and, and moving to the triple elimination, but there's still a lot of barrier to tackles. And I'd like to highlight only a, a few main barriers because the other barriers, I think the other speakers also, also highlight and it's not too far different from uh, our experience in the country. Yeah, so in our program, it's quite complex, you know, because of the multiple programs involved in the triple elimination effort. So uh, for the CDC, which is the Communicable Disease uh, Prevention, you know, and Control, leads the viral hepatitis, you know, whereas the HIV program call and charts, you know, responsible for the HIV and syphilis, yeah? And NMCXC, which is the Maternal and Child Health Care, uh, which is the frontline program implementing the three tests, uh, 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 integration of the, the three tests at the frontline level, yeah, meaning from the healthcare uh, center, yeah. So these three programs, you know, barely talk to each other, you know, barely communicate quite clearly about the, especially the, the, the clinical management guideline for PMTCT. For example, the CDC prefer having the viral load uh, best test uh, for the pregnant woman diagnosed uh, with the HBV, you know, uh, from the surface antigen to continue the treatment uh, starting from the, for example, gene expert uh, testing because they believe that it's the golden standard. Whereas the NMCXC program or PMTCT program would like to introduce e-antigen because, because of the study uh, uh, Taprom algorithm showing that there's a cost benefits for, for the algorithm to be implemented, especially in the remote area. Yeah. So the algorithm from Taprum, which is you know, quite uh, effective uh, according to the, the study uh, conclusion, it is simple and it's based uh, you know, off on the e-antigen rapid test or evaluated on uh, Trongzamena, uh, which is ALT test, to evaluate you know, the women who are uh, eligible for treatment. But, you know, which is, uh, but the, the, the recommendation, it's not quite preferred because CDC believe that rapid test of the e-antigen is not WHO PQ. So it, it's difficult for the CDC program to justify for the PQ uh, product to be included in the procurement plan next year. Yeah, using the $1 million budget approved by the Ministry of Economic and Finance. Yeah. And for the second barrier in country, it is about the scale up and how are we going to finance it. While the program is small and it's still undergoing the pilot, we don't know the future yet. 
So significant investment on the program is a huge, uh, is, is very important, yeah. So as you may know that um, the treatment for Hep B, which is uh, TDF, yeah, is, you know, it's still uh, expensive and <coughs> it's not affordable by the national program of uh, maternal and child health uh, center. So many women who are under the study right now, how they are uh, buying the drug by themselves because of the government funding is very small, you know, it's not uh, able to expand to many uh, population as uh, expected. Uh, the study uh, population is quite uh, big in, in Phnom Penh city alone, yeah? But uh, the budget from the government taking long time and uh, very small funding for this pilot, so make it difficult for the case uh, to make it is a uh, successful advocate for the gov to the government. Yeah. In addition to that, I would like to highlight that the commitment from, from the Global Fund is also crucial. Um, you know, this grant, the Global Fund is uh, allowing the um, NMCC program to start the pilot, just to understand how the uptake should be and uh, what would be the strategy for the next uh, global fund round? Yeah, it keep delaying, and because of the global fund, uh, some condition, you know, they're not allowing the NMCC program to procure the commodity. Yeah, so uh, it's 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 a big challenge for the pilot to find the funding and resource, you know, find resources in the country to do it. Yeah, in the meantime, CDC as the coordinating. Uh, and leading uh, agency for the viral hepatitis has not communicate clearly with the national program of uh, maternal and child health. So the coordination has just started and I think uh, will be a bit better in 2023 because the TWG, you know, start to combine PMTCT, TWG and viral hepatitis, TWG. So we talk about it together. Yeah. So on the treatment affordability, I think it's also important. I heard many countries talk about the, you know, uh, uh, burst dose uh, vaccine, uh, which is slightly uh, different in Cambodia. We've got a high burst dose rate in Cambodia, but we are very concerning about the vertical transmission and how to prevent the disease progression, you know, while the mother is seeking ANC care and will uh, deliver the baby, you know. So I think this is important that um, the treatment uh, would be uh, crucial. You know, I've, I've, uh, we assume that after the study conclude, we would need, you know, to find options for the treatment for those mothers who are positive on the um, HBV. Yeah. And it is small in terms of budget, and we don't know whether the negligible fund round, it would be possible to make a big scale up in the country. And back to the CDC program, which is the economics, uh, budget from the Econo uh, Ministry of Economics and Finance, we've got only about a million dollars. Yes, and it covers general population, and it covers Hep C and Hep B, you know. And there will be a lot less money left uh, for the HBV PMTCT program. And as you can see from the slide here, the treatment actually accessible at the private providers, but the cost is a huge difference. You know, a one person can access to about, uh, uh, can access to treatment using about uh, $360 for a year. Whereas the, the budget, you know, from the global fund, which is, uh, you know, uh, procuring um, TDF for a PLHIV costs at about three to four dollars per bottle. So I think it's 10 times different. So in terms of uh, treatment, there's a, a big gap in the country as well. So uh, it's, 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 it's making the three programs, you know, discussing how to move forward with the, you know, treatment, you know, uh, which donor to uh, look out to, and we are trying to find different mechanisms to make the treatment affordable by not just the, uh, using the global fund or donor funding, but the government budget should be also playing some part in this. Yeah, and uh, I'd sorry, like sorry. to end my presentation here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you.
And you perfectly demonstrated the path from going to, from double to triple elimination. So thank you so much for that. So from two implementers, we'll now go to two members of parliament um, to give their perspectives. So first, um, we'll start with the Honorable Maria Jose Plaza, who is a, a member of parliament in Ecuador. Thank you and good afternoon to everybody. First of all, I would like to thank UNITE and the multiple organizations for taking part in this event. I hope this summit will help all of us exchange experience and provide more knowledge to face public health problems. And now I'm going to switch to Spanish and I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens with hepatitis B in my country. In Ecuador, is totally compromised in engaged in the fight against hepatitis to eradicate hepatitis B. Uh, several actions have been led to achieve the 2030 um, um, target. We, we have implemented pen, the uh, five uh, 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 at, um, uh, or pentavaccine, uh, which includes uh, um, hepatitis uh, B, uh, in order to uh, prevent this infection. In 2021, only 148 cases of hepatitis B were reported, mainly and uh, mainly in Quito, the uh, uh, capital, and uh, age group 20 to 49 years old. Nevertheless, the Ecuadorian government is wants to get to those uh, areas where the population could not have access to the vaccine. In this area, there is a high prevalence and uh, we need studies to uh, find about the consequences of hepatitis B in those areas. Now, let's not forget uh, hepatitis B is immunopreventable and vaccination is indispensable to uh, uh, prevent uh, contamination and uh, and uh, that it may evolve to more serious uh, pathologies like um, liver cancer. We have a full package of actions that in, in line with the WHO strategy and the American, the Pan-American Health uh, Organization. Now, all concerning the eradication of, of this disease. So we have uh, permanent surveys throughout the uh, um, health sector in um, Ecuador uh, for an early diagnosis, a follow-up uh, both for the mother and for uh, kids, uh, uh, children uh, until 18 months of age. Uh, we have a strategy to detect the infection in an, in um, pre-birth uh, stage and uh, prevent a vertical transmission later. In 2019, we try to innovate uh, the surveillance epidemiological surveillance systems to generate uh, warning signs and create surveillance strategies and control strategies of this pathology. It's important also to mention that these uh, policies go hand in hand with the development plan and the health plan uh, that has been devised for 2030. The actions are set so that by 2023 there will be a, uh, a vaccination in, uh, across the country, including uh, to uh, 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 implement this multi-sectorial plan according to the WHO uh, strategy, uh, eliminating VH, uh, H, uh, HIV and other uh, sexual transmitted diseases like hepatitis B. Many actions have been implemented to achieve this goal at national level an international level and the results have been positive this work also showed that there are barriers and challenges uh, uh, and we are, that the national health authority is faced with one is the budget issue in order to implement the national strategy and the strategic plan we are talking about treatments costly treatments and uh, uh, and medication Ten million dollars are spent for this purpose, but the budget could uh, um, allocate uh, um, if if it was um, uh, if it had more resources, we could solve this in, in in a shorter period of time. 
but we want to uh, uh, implement this across the all public uh, uh, um, health uh, network and also with uh, international support. The National Health Authority is ha working hardly developing preventing uh, strategies to attain this international goal minus 0.1% of the population uh, contaminated or infected and the importance of having studies of the prevalence of these diseases uh, thanks to which we will be able to structure the necessary public policies. Let me stress that the Equatorian government is also working to supply appropriately and timely of, the me of medication so that all population that is suffering from these diseases may have immediate access to that medication. Besides, the legislative power is making sure that quality health care is provided, namely as far as uh, providing medication is concerned and treatment for an opportune uh, treatment, not just for hepatitis B, but for all these types of uh, disease. The National uh, Parliament has an oversighting uh, role very important to make sure that the health um, agencies do their job and that there is there are the necessary uh, laws to ensure health quality health care and that it covers the expectations of the vulnerable groups like those that suffer from hepatitis b legislators should convey the voices and concerns of all persons and mainly those that have this type of sexual transmitted diseases and are affected by them and most times they live in marginal communities as leaders and opinion makers and participating in decision making processes the parliamentarians can promote values of respect empathy and uh, awareness up to uh, uh, diseases like hepatitis b moreover we can adopt and supervise the implementation of laws that protect promote and ensure uh, and guarantee the rights and this in this uh, oversight uh, uh, role we can make sure that the pledges are uh, respected it's in our hands to supervise the implementation of this legislation that guarantees the rights of citizens and if you give me a little more time i just like to say two important things <laughs> a little one <laughs> no. just uh, well go to the last point additionally from the legislative legislative function we promote reforms to the public public procurement law which proposes to give greater speed to the process of purchase purchase and acquisition of medicines for all types of treatment and to ensure that the purchasing system that we have in ecuador does not be an obstacle for patients to access their treatment thank you very much muchas gracias I mean, I think one thing that's come up in all uh, the talks so far is the issue of financing being a barrier for hepatitis. I think that's a common challenge we all face. But the thing that I like most about your, when you said the parliamentarian's role in increasing respect, empathy, and awareness, or creating, a, I think that is so important. So thank you so much for saying that. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to go to Malaysia. And for our, on the end of our panel, Calvin Yi Li Wen, um, who's a member of parliament in Malaysia. Calvin, please. Sure. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon to my fellow colleagues and, of course, the good uh, healthcare advocates from, of course, World Hepatitis Alliance, as well as other health organizations pushing this very, very important topic that is very, very personal and close to my heart. Uh, I know afternoon sessions are the toughest, so let me try to keep it concise as well as to share the experience of Malaysia when it comes to first dual elimination and as we are pushing for triple elimination. Uh, Malaysia was actually one of the earliest, uh, early adopters of globally of national prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV and syphilis. 
in maternal and child health services. Uh, prevention of mother-to-child transmission, PMTCT, program for HIV was implemented countrywide in 1998, where else PMTCT or syphilis started a decade earlier. In line with the WHO guideline, Malaysia actually adopted a target of uh, less than 2.2% of HIV mothers to child transmission rate and congenital syphilis case rate of less than 50 per 100,000 uh, live births. Birth, sorry. So the country started antenatal HIV screening in 1997, and today antenatal testing and treatment for HIV and syphilis are provided free of charge and virtually all women have access to quality health services, including contraceptions and birth-assisted skill attendance. And as a result, number of babies born with HIV or syphilis has reduced to the level of compatibility with the global elimination criteria. So in two decades, uh, the efforts by the Malaysian government has paid off. In 2018, actually, Malaysia was certified by WHO as to having eliminated mother-to-child transmission of HIV and syphilis. It is the first country in WHO Western Pacific region to achieve this milestone. And um, of course, this elimination could not have been achieved without Malaysia's strong commitment to ensuring access to quality and affordable health services for all women, children, and families. So achieving elim elimination is not the end of our struggle to ensure every Malaysian child starts life healthy and free of HIV and syphilis. It is the beginning of a never-ending journey to provide exceptional quality of care to prevent all infection that pass from one mother to child. And the next target they were targeting is hepatitis B. So just to give a context, Malaysia is a country of medium serial prevalence for hepatitis B. Uh, general population, we're looking at 1.5% to about 9.8%. So estimated 1 million people are chronically infected with hepatitis B in Malaysia. Uh, most HBV carriers are infected prenatally owing to high viral load in Malaysian mothers uh, of childbearing age. Um, approximately 75% of all viral hepatitis cases are due to hepatitis B. Uh, chronic hepatitis B accounts for more than 80% of hepatocellular carcinoma in our country and it's the third most common malignant neoplasm as well as the 10th leading cause in our nation. So the first Hep B program was actually initiated in 1974 where we started screening blood donors at that time. Uh, the National Immunization Program, it was inserted only in 1989 and HBV uh, screening among high-risk antenatal mothers was early uh, 2000. So the incident rate of HBV in Malaysia from 1990 to 2030 actually demonstrated a steady decrease uh, from 1990 to 1997 due to the universal vaccination of infants and also due to pro um, interventions that was done by the country. So I can give you statistics. For example, the National Hepatitis B Immunization coverage currently is about 96.32%, uh, quite encouraging. Uh, HBSG antigens detection rate is 2.5% among born in 1985. This is pre-immunization and it has declined to 0.4% posts, uh, those born in 1996, about a year, uh, about seven years after that. So another study, overall prevalence of a HB antigen, prevalence was 0 0.62. Uh, it was 1.08 among those in 1989, and only 0 0.2 among those born after 1989. So we see uh, this trend actually shows an attested efficacy of the universal infant HBV vaccination program for protection against, of course, chronic HBV infection. Uh, and we look at overall incidence. We only, as of September uh, this year, only 10 cases per 100,000 population. So of course, but then there will be some disease burden that will continue to remain as infected people, of course, are living longer and uh, getting older. So what is the target moving forward? Uh, Malaysia is, of course, committed in combating viral hepatitis by 2030. In working towards this, uh, this target, we actually have a national strategic plan that has been developed and is the first in our country. Uh, this is, of course, national strategic plan for hepatitis B and C, mm -hmm. and it documents a structured, a comprehensive strategy, a plan of action for planning, implementation, monitoring, evaluation of our hepatitis programs, and of course, activities throughout the country. Uh, five main pillars, and I'm going to go really quick around it. Strategy one is, of course, advocacy, communication, social mobilization, 
Strategy two is quality and coverage of prevention programs. Strategy three, access to diagnostic treatment and care. Strategy four, quality strategic information, monitoring, evaluation, and research. Uh, strategy five is capacity building and enhancement. And uh, if allow me a little bit of time, I also speak to my fellow parliamentarians on what I think the important roles that we play, especially to get the conversation going and make sure this is implemented. Uh, number one, I like, sorry, I like numbers. So five, five keys that I'd like to share with my fellow MPs. Number one, if there are countries that are yet to implement this, keep fighting for it, uh, get bipartisan support, make it a national agenda. I know change perspective of governments. I understand the major uh, uh, obstacle is always funding. But let us try to shift a paradigm shift to invest into healthcare, which is not a liability, but an investment. Let us push the agenda of health in every policy of government. I think that is very important, and I think we MPs play an important role to do that. Number two, uh, it's not just about funding, it's about management and implementation. So countries that have already implemented it, it is our role as an MP to monitor, to scrutinize, to keep it accountable, to make sure it achieves its target, and that's what I'm doing in our country. Number three, it's important for us to educate, to build trust with our constituents, to have compassion, as was mentioned, and also to ensure they are compliant to treatment, improve adherence to treatment, and of course, getting the mothers to do the postnatal vaccination. Uh, number four, um, let's do hepatitis B specific community workforce. It is very important to promote uh, community-led solutions. People impacted by viral hepatitis are actually central and effective national response, and our partnership with this affected communities give us a better understanding uh, and connection with the diverse communities impacted by viral hepatitis, and this partnership is what helps us succeed in what we want to do. And um, number five, um, let, let us not uh, just make this a domestic conversation, but we need a global conversation on this. Uh, this is a global pro problem, and a global problem needs a global response. And allow me to end uh, it with uh, actually a personal story. Uh, why I am very uh, personally attached to this. I know of a person who was diagnosed with hepatitis B, and he was a trained medical doctor, and because of that, he was very limited in the disciplines that he could practice. So it limited his dream, it limited his passion. His brother, uh, and this was born pre-1989, his brother uh, got a dream job in a country which he really wanted to go, and because of his condition, he was not allowed to go. So that is why, and the sister in that family um, was born post-89 and she was free of hepatitis B. So that is why decisions that we make as parliamentarians and policymakers change lives, stop people, allow people to fulfill their dreams, allow people to fulfill the potential, allow people to not to be discriminated because something that they could not control. And I think we all play a role in that. And actually that person, it's me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, uh, yeah, thanks for the numbers. Thanks for your story. And just thanks for everything that you guys are doing um, in Malaysia. Okay, so I'm going to pass back over. Yes, thank you so much. And um, well, um, now we are going to present the next um, panelist, Jessica Hicks, Director of World Hepat Hepatitis Alliance. And she is going to speak about policy recommendations and funding opportunities. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here on behalf of the World Hepatitis Alliance. Um, I do have a couple of slides if they could be brought up. Uh, just while they're coming up, uh, the World Hepatitis Alliance is an international umbrella organization, and we have over 300 members in 101 countries who are all civil society organizations, and along with them, we work to uh, raise awareness, influence policy, and drive action to improve the lives of people living with viral hepatitis. So can I get my slides? In, uh, well, just uh, this year on World Hepatitis Day, we launched a, a new white paper, uh, Mothers and Babies Can't Wait, Fighting Mother to Child Transmission. And this is because, as we've heard throughout the session, when it comes to prevention of mother to child transmission, hepatitis B is woefully behind uh, efforts to eliminate HIV and syphilis. And 
we developed the white paper in consultation with people living with viral hepatitis who have been impacted either uh, through being able to access the birth dose or more importantly, not being able to access the birth dose. And I think as Shaibu, Kelvin, and this quote from Sue really illustrate, this is an incredibly urgent problem that we need to address now. And so through the white paper, we developed a number of policies that really, we believe, if implemented, would set out um, PMTCT services that are equitable, accessible, and available to everyone that needs them. So I'll very quickly uh, talk to each of these policies, but I think they address a number of the barriers that we've already heard today. So hepatitis B education must be provided to pregnant women as a prenatal standard of care, allowing women to be empowered and informed. And we've heard about lack of awareness from multiple speakers. Healthcare professionals are critical to this, uh, and they must be given mandatory training to increase access to services and reduce hepatitis-related stigma in antenatal care. We need education programs providing accurate information, sharing people's experience of living with hepatitis B. I think you know, we can all agree that the stories, when people are brave enough to stand up and share their stories, they are the most impactful part of any presentation, any session. Um, Community-based organizations really need to be resourced and empowered to inform and support communities and play a recognized role in both care systems and hepatitis B elimination. Uh, and finally, funding and resources must be provided to support the implementation of known cost-effective prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV, hepatitis, and syphilis interventions. And the discussion this morning was really around the role of uh, MPs and civil society. And as a civil society representative, we definitely see this relationship as one of collaboration. So we have developed these policies. We advocate firmly for their introduction at a national level, but we need your help to champion them. We really need you in your own settings to take the policies that are most relevant forward, to be champions for those within parliament, and to also hold governments to account to the commitment they made in 2016 to eliminate viral hepatitis, including hepatitis B and prevention of mother-to-child transmission by 2030. The final policy around funding is a big one. We've heard multiple speakers today say that funding continues to be a serious barrier. Um, and so I did want to touch on that as well, because as Carrie mentioned this morning during the Global Fund session, in the new information note from the Global Fund for this funding round, there is increased support for viral hepatitis. And relative to this session specifically, there is uh, support for triple elimination programs. And so for pregnant and breastfeeding women, HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis B testing during antenatal care visits and confirmatory testing and prophylaxis treatment can be um, applied for in Global Fund concept notes. And so we would really you know, encourage you to go back to your country armed with this knowledge. It does, the Global Fund does also support um, viral hepatitis uh, through harm reduction services and also for people living with HIV in key populations. But I know that we are running short of time, so I won't talk to those. Just to say that we are holding a webinar on this next Tuesday. So if anyone is interested in learning more about the Global Fund support for viral hepatitis and just the Global Fund um, application mechanism in general, we'll share details of that after the event, uh, along with a link to the white paper that I mentioned with those policy recommendations. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you for your policy recommendations. And now uh, we are going to have uh, the last speaker. It's a, um, a video that we can put. Uh, we have the video prepared. It's from Australia. And uh, it's a pre-recorded video 
from Hepatitis Australia featuring multiple stakeholders discussing the role of community groups. Community-driven work is essential to the elimination of Hepatitis B. Thank, Thank you for the invitation to be part of the UNITE Summit. We are joining, joining from the lands of the Ngunnawal people and pay our respects to elders past and present. We also, we also pay our respects to all Indigenous people who are attending the summit. The prevalence of hepatitis B in Australia is one in a hundred people, and it disproportionately affects some groups including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the Indigenous peoples of Australia. Since 2010, Australia has had a national hepatitis B strategy, which is endorsed by all Australian health ministers and is consistent with the global strategy. Australia is developing, developing its next strategy, strategy which, which will be the final national, national policy framework before the 2030 elimination deadline. In many, In many ways, ways, Australia is a privileged place, place with a strong health system and a positive policy environment, including bipartisan, bipartisan parliamentarian support for viral hepatitis elimination. Despite this, Australia, Australia is failing to achieve its national hepatitis B targets, which, which are coherent, coherent with the global elimination targets. targets. There, are there are two exceptions to this. First, First is the childhood vaccination target. target. Infant, Infant hepatitis B vaccination uptake among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is an ongoing success. In 2020, the proportion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander infants fully vaccinated with hepatitis B at 24 months of age was 97.3% above the national target and exceeded vaccination uptake among non-Indigenous infants at 24 months of age. The second, the second is where communities are resourced and mobilised to act on hepatitis B. We achieve, we achieve much more effective results. For example, for example the HEP-B PASS team in the Northern Territory, which has achieved more than double the care and treatment uptake compared to the national average. What those two examples, two examples have in common is that Indigenous communities have led the responses. By investing well and intensifying our responses to hepatitis B, particularly in partnership with communities, we can, we can take examples of success, of success and transform, transform the response to hepatitis B elimination for all. We have, we have the tools for appropriate management of hepatitis B, and it is amongst, amongst the most cost-effective cost cancer prevention strategies that countries can, can invest in. Community, community engagement and leadership of the response and resourcing the community are hallmarks of how Australia has made world-leading achievements in HIV and hepatitis C responses, and it is urgently needed for hepatitis B. We are, we are proud, proud to, to showcase heavy be passed by this upcoming video. video. Hello. Hello, my, my name, name is Rachel Minipinwudi. Um, I'm doing video, video recording, recording, a voice recording, recording in, in my, my language, TV, TV about, about hepatitis, hepatitis B and so, so that, that I can, can show, show my TV, TV people on, on had to look after themselves and had to look after their liver. My mana. Hello, my name is Lucy. I'm the Nolan community today. I am a resident of the country. We are a community with our children and our children following up on the TV. I have to get a little money and I have to get a little bit of 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 a Education session, these are fine. We follow up to us. Help them understand why we need to go into the department and move on. We appreciate that they receive their responses, they share their responses. That is a client that has helped us and I will have been doing the hospital today and the day today. I feel very strongly that we keep the idea that this is like a community. And if that client is very happy, very conscious, very conscious, it is going to be very strong and very happy. So thanks to the positive people rather than to be the free law. 
My name is Associate Professor J. J. Davis, and I am so enormously proud to be part of Happy Being Past. This true partnership is successfully demonstrating that you can eliminate hepatitis B and provide holistic care to those living with chronic hepatitis B when you work together with the community. Using this participatory approach, we are now exceeding national targets in the Northern Territory for the over 30,000 Aboriginal people who are part of FAB Past. We have 86% of people aware of their infection, 56% of people engaged in care, and 20% receiving antiviral therapy. Excellent. Excellent, excellent video. Bueno, well, we are in the end of the presentations, but now we are going to open the discussion. So, Kari. Thank um, you very much. Um, yes, so you've seen, you know, we've had a tour around the world, talked about different um, aspects of it. So, please, we'd love to hear your questions and your comments for our panelists or to hear about the situation in your own countries and maybe some of the ways that you overcome the challenges you have. Yeah, please just put your things up. Sorry, sir. Yeah, thank you all very much for your presentations, quite rich. And uh, I think they are so insightful. I just have this uh, simple question, uh, maybe for any of you will be able to provide uh, uh, the answer about uh, triple elimination. Um, after all these interventions, I think it's quite interesting to know that uh, much more has to be done. But I just want to find out uh, how can we support countries from uh, low and middle income, uh, you know, that bracket, uh, to effectively implement uh, uh, triple elimination? Thank you very much. So I, I think there's, um, maybe I'll start if anyone else you want to come in, Jess, as well. Um, but I think we've touched on a few of them. Um, triple elimination is now being supported by, by Global Fund. Um, so this next round of funding, you can apply for support for triple elimination programs within the Global Fund. Um, UNICEF is now, is, has now adopted, and WHO has adopted triple elimination as an official strategy. So you'll see through UNICEF-supported um, programs and through you know, WHO work that triple elimination is now the strategy that they're pursuing for prevention of mother-to-child transmission. Um, another thing that we're doing is we're, uh, like I mentioned before, is we're really ac actively advocating for Gavi to support birth dose um, roll out to support countries to provide birth dose, especially in sub-Saharan Africa where um, coverage is so low. Um, so we're really hoping that they are going to um, accelerate their program. That they have, they have already said back in 2018 that they would, um, that they were going to pursue a birth dose program, but because of the pandemic and COVID-19, that's been put on hold. Um, so we're strongly encouraging them to. Um, to, to start again and to really amplify the program because, I mean, the numbers are, you know, a quarter of a million babies every year born with hepatitis B, which acquired at birth. I mean, and, you know, one in four of those will go on to die from liver disease or, or cirrhosis. So it's really too many, and it's too many to act slowly on this. We need, we need action now and we need it quickly. Um, Jess, do you have anything? I think the only thing I would add is and what we've seen through some of the country examples today is that a lot of low and middle income countries do have really strong HIV maternal and child health services and where those exist there's a great opportunity to really build upon that platform and integrate hepatitis B into already existing structures rather than duplicate or try and create vertical programming and I think that's sort of what all the country examples showed us today is just that power of looking at what is already in the country and what are the platforms that we can leverage on to include hepatitis B. And then there is that, yeah, as Carrie mentioned, there is still some funding gaps. And so looking at what global donors maybe can help support that alongside some domestic financing. 
Exactly, yeah. Sometimes a small step to the side can lead to a big step forward, like we say. So if you can find ways to integrate, to you know, put it all into already existing systems, then that's a smaller investment will get you a bigger result. I hope that answered your question, at least partially. Thank you. Um, the the um, woman behind you. Thank you so much. Um, I've seen some kind of uh, is it, uh, programs that maybe have been done in Africa, and uh, the kind of maybe those have been the patients. So I was just wondering if this uh, disease is more prevalent in Africa. I would like to find out that maybe is there any uh, scientific uh, proof of, or maybe scientific reasons as to why it's so prevalent in Africa. And secondly, um, there hasn't been much of uh, awareness created. Um, this worries me a lot as a member of parliament, and um, a member of parliament who has been privileged to live in the, um, in the diaspora for 20 years, going back to Zambia, I've noticed that what is normally where uh, awareness is created most is for HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, like maybe cholera, like in times like uh, rain season, because that's the time we have these diseases, cholera. But uh, we have diseases that are claiming people. Um, for example, typhoid. Typhoid has been claiming a lot of Zambians, um, or because people take it like they have gases with just maybe peltic ulcers, like that. And they don't have a proper like examination or tests have not been done properly, somebody would just take it they're having difficulties with the stomach and we've lost a lot of people like in my constituency because it's in the rural area. Now, I just wanted to find out why this kind of a disease is not uh, much talked about, like the way HIV, even a child in primary school in the crash knows about HIV AIDS, but about hepatitis, they don't seem to know. And uh, even me, you know, I came to know about this kind of a disease, I think some, maybe two years ago, that there's such a disease. No one talks about, I think there's supposed to be some vaccination or something. No one talks about it. I was really shocked. So uh, much has not been done to create awareness. So what is your organization going to do in order to help the members of parliament to be able to spread this information, because it's very, very important. In Africa, we are so suspicious, superstitious. We always believe it could be witchcraft and this and that, and I believe a lot of people are dying of this disease. So how are you going to help us members of parliament? We don't like, to, I personally, as a member of parliament, to represent people from uh, a rural constituency. I don't believe in theory. I believe in practice. So we need to be practical. How are you going to help us? This disease is real. And uh, from the look of things, it's prevail, uh, more uh, in, in Africa. So how are you going to help us? So thank you. Thank you so much. I'm just going to see if any of our panelists online um, from um, maybe Fudmi, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you could address um, maybe at least maybe the first of those questions around the um, prevalence of um, hepatitis B in Africa and why perhaps people think it's so high, why scientifically it's so high. So I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I just wonder if you had anything to say. Um, I, I think I can address some of the things she said. Um, right. Thank you very much for the questions. They're very important questions. Actually, I'm a hepatologist, and for two decades, I've worked in Nigeria and in the Gambia, managing liver cancer and liver cirrhosis from hepatitis B. For quite a while, our data systems did not link hepatitis and liver cancer. 
the way HIV is linked with the disease called AIDS. The hepatitis B was not clearly linked with the disease called liver cancer and liver cirrhosis. And when it was finally done, the scope and the depth of the hepatitis B challenge became known. And that is part of why the Global Hepatitis Program in WHO was formed. And that is why the hepatitis elimination agenda came on board in 2015, 2016. So it's an old disease that has now been repackaged to highlight the mortalities of hepatitis B, and it has now become very significant. That's number one. Another response to what she has said is very importantly, many of the diseases she has mentioned have global funding support. So HIV is globally funded, TB and many of these diseases are globally funded, which means we're talking about donor funding. So there has been very limited donor funding for viral hepatitis. And that is one of the important perspectives. And that is part of why we're talking about triple elimination. In terms of data, there is also a lot of data in Africa about viral hepatitis. And hepatitis was quite prevalent in Southeast Asia and many of those parts of the world, including South America. But 20 years of consistent childhood vaccination has brought the prevalence in these countries to very low. On the other hand, in Africa, the health systems are quite weak <clears throat> and the vaccination has not been very deep. And right now, most of the burden remains in many low middle income countries with weak systems. Maybe I will stop here. It's a fourth aspect is data. And to give you an example, if we look at death rates or causes of deaths, death registries in Africa, they are very thin, they are not available. We have better vital systems for birth rates than death rates. So the causes of deaths are often not known except from the history. So those are four good reasons why the maybe there hasn't been enough um, awareness about viral hepatitis. And this is why we are this panel to raise the awareness. I hope I have addressed some of the questions. Thank you and over to you. Great, thank you, Funmi. We just have maybe one more question, and then I'll give over to my co-chair to wrap us up. So please. Más que una pregunta, yo quiero insistir con la educación. I know you talked about training, and I think it's important that we focus on this, especially in prevention. We we vaccines are not are not enough. We have to teach, we have to train, we have to teach the children, we have to act on the level of schools. And we... There can't be any taboos. It's odd to hear that people can sometimes, some parliamentarians may not be aware of some diseases that are going on in their countries, and we need to act as soon as possible. And you have an, uh, another question? A oh. short one. Yeah. Buenas tardes, de nuevo, amigos y amigas. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd just like to address the last speaker. I loved your story and I admire the effort, your, your effort in order to eradicate this disease, these diseases. We're here today because we're all committed to 
eliminating these illnesses. And we need to stick to the agreement that we committed to in our last meeting in Argentina. We need to add more bodies, more parliamentarians to our cause. And we're doing all we can to achieve practical results. So we're, we're working with Anita, with Gisela. We're all working together. And we're working with other parliamentarians in order to have a stronger organization. I'd like to add that in my country, in Honduras, we've increased our budget for health, and this is a major victory for us. As of next year, we'll launch the construction of six new hospitals, and this is something momentous for us. The, the, the issue of health coverage was still lacking. We, li we come from a very hilly country. There's a lot of mountains. And uh, we want to make it easier for people to have access to health care. As young people and as diplomatic representatives of our countries, we want to eliminate, eradicate these diseases. And we want to work with the Pan American Parliament in order to have more voices, more bodies with our cause. Well, we are in the, in the end of our panel. So uh, thank you all of us for being with us. The triple elimination is so important. So thank you for your commitment. It is a target to achieve, and parliamentarians have a key role to play. Vaccination for all should be our goal, and we have to push for access to vaccination and better budgets all around the world. Uh, in 2000, Argentina added uh, to the mandatory vaccination calendar the hepatitis vaccines in childbirth, and many countries did the same, as we know. And there are many countries that didn't do this, and we have to achieve this goal. Uh, if we do the things that we were talking in this panel, probably we are going to save more lives, and this is our target. It's a big challenge to find the resources to vaccinate and to treat hepatitis. People should be in the center of health, and health is always a political decision. So thank you all for all being here with us today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, I can say that was really an, an engaging and dynamic uh, panel session, giving us examples uh, not only of challenges worldwide, but ways forward worldwide on how we can uh, start to engage more thoughtfully for hepatitis elimination. And so, um, what was now transitioning for the remainder of the day, what was originally scheduled was for uh, a continued regional dialogue on uh, TB elimination. Uh, however, considering the delays and the schedule changes that we've had to, for today, we felt that it would be uh, more interesting and more dynamic and fun for the guests to continue the discussion on TB at the dinner this evening. And so we will close out on the sessions for today Today, and we look forward to seeing you all at the gala dinner tonight. So important information on the dinner. There will be a bus waiting for you at 7.30 at the Lumen Hotel. And then the dinner will begin at 8 o'clock at the Lisbon City Hall. So thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. And enjoy your afternoon. And we will see you very shortly. Thank you. <laughs>